to show how a reflux is performed. In organic chemistry, we often use solvents, diethyl ether, dichloromethane, other solvents as well, uh, that are both flammable and fairly volatile. Heating these solutions causes their own specific set of problems. Uh, flammability is an issue, as well as vapors that would really make the lab quite uncomfortable. But it is a necessity in a lot of our experiments, so we have very specific ways of dealing with these volatile solvents. You'll recognize this from an earlier video. I have a round bottom flask, I've got a stir bar in it, and a stir. I need a heat source. Now it really does depend on the solvent that you're using. Uh, several heat sources can work. Uh, I plan to do a, uh, a reflux uh, momentarily using diethyl ether. Diethyl ether, a flammable organic solvent that doesn't smell that nice, boils at about 36, 37 degrees Celsius. It doesn't require a lot of heat. So our heating sources can be quite mild. In some instances, simply hot water is sufficient. Other times, we may want to use what is referred to as a heating mantle, and I'll show how that uh, gets put together. So I'll put my safety glasses on. I will introduce a approximately 20, eh, 40, 50 mils of diethyl ether into my reaction vessel. And because of its volatility, I'm just going to take one of our uh, glass stoppers and put it in place while I get the rest of the solution together. Standing here, uh, I can already smell the fumes. You can imagine that with a number of 15, 20 students in the laboratory, unless you're quite careful, the lab can get a very overwhelming smell. Uh, I really recommend and insist that students will stopper their organic vapors uh, whenever they're not actively doing things. Now, to illustrate the reflexing, I've just taken some simple indicator. Typically, we'll be doing an experiment, we'll have salts, we'll have other reagents, organic materials in here, and sometimes it will be colored, sometimes it will not, but I'm just going to put a bit of colored indicator in here just to illustrate the process. Just a simple acid base indicator. I'm not quite sure what color it's going to end up once it's in there. The indicator, which I added, uh, has dissolved in the diethyl ether. It is a water-based indicator, and you might be able to see there is a secondary phase in the bottom adds to sort of the, the complexity of the mixture, but you appreciate I'm stirring quite nicely, uh, I've contained the, the fumes, now I'm going to go ahead and heat the system. Now, of course I won't heat a closed system, that's going to cause its own set of problems. Um, also, because of the low boiling point of diethyl ether, I fully expect this material to boil quickly, I will have to use a condenser. We have two types of condensers, they're interchangeable, we have something called a distillation column, uh, it tends to be a little wider, it's got some subtle changes that we need not be going to, but it will work quite nicely. There is a hollow tube, so when I place it in the flask, it is actually open to the environment. There are two spigots and a water or a jacket around the inner column which will pass water through that allows cooling to occur. And as vapor boils, when we heat, they hit the cold water or the cold jacket, condense and return back to the, the flask does two nice things, three nice things. It keeps the smell down, it maintains the level of the solvent in the container, as well as it maintains the reaction at exactly the boiling point of the solvent. So this will be diethyl ether. Once I set up a, 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 a reflux apparatus, I can heat it and walk away, being assured that if it's boiling, it is exactly at 38 degrees Celsius. No warmer, no colder. If it's refluxing, it's at 38 degrees Celsius. Other solvents, having different boiling points, methanol, ethanol, etc., have their own distinct boiling points, and that's the beauty of reflux. It's a very simple heating process, and it guarantees the temperature is maintained at a very specific temperature, which, without that, is a quite a tricky process to achieve. So I'll go ahead and set up the condenser. We need hoses. So this is going to pass water through the column. So uh, we're intending to have water in through the bottom and then out through the top. All right, so I take one of the hoses and just gently push it onto the spigot, ensuring that it's on at least a full centimeter to ensure that there's a good uh, connection the hose doesn't come off. The other uh, end will be uh, to our water source, so I'll place that here and again gently pushing. 
If it's a little sticky, a little spritz of water from a water bottle helps it go on, but this seems to be working quite nicely. Uh, take a second hose, and the exit spigot, and I'm just about ready to go. Now, it's not uncommon, students will just be quite happy to put the condenser in place like this. There's a few problems with that. We have the tension of the hoses, it's going to get heavier with the water in it, and sometimes this is a little top heavy and it's, it tends to, to flop back and forth. Uh, absolutely not recommended. Uh, what I would get you to do is introduce a second clamp. Three prong clamps actually work very well for this. And this is going to be a support. It's not a tight clamp, it's just going to be in place to stop the rotation of the whole assembly. So I'm just going to put it here. And again, it's a support, it's not tight. We don't need too many contact points here. It's just going to stop that whole apparatus from moving left to right. So, mix it in. And adjusting. Again, and again, I stop for the whole system. Now, this system is secure. It is tight here. This is holding the reaction vessel or the reaction pot. And this clamp is actually loose, and I can illustrate that quite nicely is it moves freely. That's very useful to have. If under heating circumstances uh, or any number of reasons you want to remove the heat source, it's an extremely simple process. You can simply lift it up, heating stops, and the reaction can become, if it has become uncontrolled, uh, tends to settle down immediately. So loose, but secure enough that it stops it moving left to right. Now, you order the water. What I strongly recommend is you use a, a, a additional clamp holder onto the exit hose. And what I do is I just loosen it gently, slip the hose into one of the, the clamps, and just, we're, we're not trying to close the, the, the hose off by tightening it too much, but it's just simply snugged a little bit so the hose does not come uh, out of the clamp. And then I put this in the sink. That stops the hose from making it out on the bench top because you've adjusted equipment and flooding the area. This is just a very useful way that when we have the condenser going, the exit ends up in the sink. The water source uh, will vary from lab to lab, but here in Vernon, uh, they're on the vertical uh, pillar of our uh, upper or lab shelf. And I just rotate this gently to get some water flowing through our system. Now, we don't need a massive amount of water. We need more than a trickle, but you can see here, we're slowly displacing all the air, and off we go. To give you some illustration, that's more than sufficient of water flow. Tucking the hoses out of the way, I'm just about ready to start my reflux. I need a heat source. Diethyl ether boils at a low temperature. We, can, we have several options. One, which we often use for diethyl ether, is simply a hot water source. So, Coming off the hot plate, I've got some water that's near boiling, probably 080, 85 degrees Celsius, so it's quite hot, maybe it's a little cooler. Uh, Recrystallization dish, and that's going to be hot enough to boil our water. Add hot water, lower my system. Oops. Quick adjustment. And before the heat source goes in, I want to make sure that my system is open to the air. I want to heat a closed system. Stopper comes off, water's on. I can either lower my flask a little ways or use my lab jack to bring the hot water up and get the system stirring. It may take a moment for the hot water to heat up the bulk of the solution as well as the glassware, but within a moment or two, we should expect this to boil uh, quite, uh, quite robustly. In this instance, we don't have an active heat source, we have a passive heat source. You may, during the experiment, have to add top up or solution with a little hot, extra hot water to encourage the reflux. After a minute or two, uh, it's not quite there yet, it's getting close though, uh, we should expect to see clear vapor of the diethyl ether uh, condensing on the inside of the flask and then returning into the bottom of the container. There we have a reflux. We know exactly, at boiling point, this solution is 38 degrees Celsius, and as long as this solution is nice and hot, uh, we've controlled the temperature nicely, and then we just have to control the time environment for this reaction to occur.
It's been less than several, uh, two minutes. It's just a titch over a minute. It's heated sufficiently that it is actively boiling. I'll, t I'll stop the stir. You can see it bubbling actively, as well as the condensation is occurring here. Common question in first year or er, in organic chemistry is: Do I need a boiling chip? Well, a boiling chip is always a good idea if you're boiling a liquid. However, we have a stir bar here, and that replaces uh, the utility of boiling chips. So as long as you have a stir bar, a boiling chip isn't required. Uh, it provides an area for the bubbles to, to nucleate on, uh, and with gentle stirring, uh, that's sufficient.